So thank you all for being here um, today. We have Deacon Ken here to speak to us about the creed, and we are grateful for this opportunity and the time that he's spending with us. So Deacon Ken, if you would like to begin us in prayer and then go from there. I will do, and welcome everybody. I'm so glad to be here, and welcome to the volunteers, and thank you for all you're doing, and welcome to the parents and your willingness to teach your kids the faith to the best of their, your ability, and that's just, that means so much. It really does. And so let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Most gracious and loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together tonight to learn and to grow. Help us all to learn just a little bit more to be able to be helpful to those kiddos and their growth and their faith. And we thank you for this creed that has been given to us to help us solidify our, our beliefs and our understandings of our faith and our church. We ask you to be with us tonight and the Holy Spirit to teach us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so I guess I'll jump in. I've got 20 minutes to talk about the creed. Okay. I'm not sure if I can read the creed in 20 minutes, okay? So here's the thing, you know, I, I have no earthly idea. I haven't practiced it out loud or anything, so I don't know how long what I have sort of put together is going to be, but I'm going to do my best. I may have to jump in and go real fast at the end, or we may get through real soon. I'm, I'm just really not sure. But talking about the creed is, I mean, you, you do understand that there's just an incredible amount of theology and facts here in our Nicene Creed. This thing has a came to be in one of the notes out here. And I'm jumping ahead already. Okay, I'm just going to try to stick with my notes so I don't go off. You know, most of you know that I was in the radio business and um, I, I worked with Ron Chapman, so some of you veterans on this call here have remember who Ron Chapman is and was, and uh, he's an incredibly talented guy. And I went and heard him speak one time, and he used he used notes, and I said, Ron, why are you using notes? He said, because if I don't use notes, I'll speak for three hours. And so <laughs> he, that that taught me a good lesson. So I'm going to go specifically to to my notes here. All right, so we got the Nicene Creed. All right. The word creed means I believe. All right. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and I hope hope you all have a copy of this. If you don't, please, please get one, especially for this topic. Incredible amount of good stuff in the CCC. Okay. In the CCC, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in number 185, if you're taking notes, it says, Whoever says, I believe, says, I pledge myself to what we believe. You say communion and faith needs a communion language of faith, normative for all and uniting all in the same confession of faith. So in a very real sense, there's unity here in this creed. This is what we believe as a church. And it was written and spelled out in 325 in the Council of Nicaea. Okay, 325 is when it first took its written form. Okay, we profess this every Sunday at Mass in the Latin Rite Catholic Church, in the Eastern Rites in, of the Catholic Church, and in our separated Orthodox brethren. The same creed is professed in its original formulation, okay? And that's important. The only difference between the creed of the East and the West is a later edition of the phrase, and the Son, to the paragraph on the procession of the Holy Spirit. Remember, unfortunately, this disagreement has really caused some difficulty and division in the churches. And that statement is, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, period, for the East, and the Son for us in the West. So that's just a little difference there. Okay, so 325, and then in the Second Council of Constantinople in 381, it was reaffirmed once again, okay? And it's preserved the faithful and the variety of heresies for now over, what, 1,700 years or whatever it is. So to understand this is what is really 
to understand what we believe as Catholics. And, and what I just said in, 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 the, in the notes here is very important. Virtually, virtually every sentence, every statement is some kind of refutation, refuting some kind of heresy. So in other words, in the early church, there was, whew, everything went this way, but what everybody was believing. And they were trying to really, really make it very concise as to what we believe. So truly, let's just take a little walk through the creed. And again, I, I'm going to go as fast as I can here. Um, but it's, it's very important to understand that we're, 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 we're jumping in here into an endless depth. In here, there's some infinite truths in here that we just cannot fully, completely grasp because we have finite minds. And some of this is infinite truths. And we try and we've done our best to, uh, to define over all of these years. But it's impossible sometimes to define an infinite truth, isn't it? You ever tried? You ever thought about that? Our finite brains cannot fully grasp an inf totally infinite truth. Because there's always one more thing. So let's start out. Part one, God the Father. We start with God the Father. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. In the CCC number 200, I'm going to read that because it's really important. There are, I believe in one God. These are the words with which the creed begins. The confession of God's oneness which has its roots in the divine revelation of the old covenant is inseparable from the profession of God's existence and is equally fundamental. God is unique. There's only one God. The Christian faith confesses that God is one in nature, substance, and essence. Okay. There's three weeks worth of study for you right there. <laughs> He's one in nature, substance, and essence. God is one God. Now, you all know and understand that there's, there's conflict here. And for an, somebody who totally doesn't know any of this, to say that we believe in one God, but then we say that God is God, Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit's God, that's confusing, isn't it? It's even confusing to us. But what this statement says is that we believe in one God. Three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? He created everything that we can see. Everything that we can see, he created. And what else? Everything that we can't see. He created angels, souls, demons. He's the Lord over all of it, and he has all the might. He is tremendously powerful, and yet... He, go, he draws us into a relationship with him and invites us to share eternal life with him. God is all powerful. He created everything. And yet he wants us. He needs us. Part two, God, the son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God. Born of the Father be for all ages. And again, all of these are statements against heresies. God from God, life from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. To him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Wow. It's a bunch there, isn't it? So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Okay, and all of these truths that are listed in here. Now, guys, here's what I want to encourage you to do. In the CCC from 420, number 422 to 420, 4, 422 to 466, incredible amount of beautiful, beautiful writing. I'm only going to read 422, okay? Obviously not all the rest.
But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. That's from Scripture. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Scripture. God has visited his people. He has fulfilled the promise he made to Abraham and his descendants. He acted far beyond all expectations. He sent his own beloved son. So here we have a beautiful explanation. The second person of the Blessed Trinity is the Word of God. Remember in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God the Son. And so Jesus Christ proceeds from the Father. He was born, not begotten. I mean, born and begotten, not made. He was not made. He wasn't made like a, born like a, any other person. He was begotten of the Father. It's a mystery. Very difficult to understand. Much ink has been spilled over the centuries in many arguments and so forth. How Jesus can be both God and man. How can that be? We can kind of see, okay, God's God. He's up there in heaven. But how can Jesus be God? But he's fully God. He's eternal. The council fathers went to great length to combat the Arian, uh, the Arian heresy, which claimed that Jesus was created, not truly God. We believe he's fully God and fully man. Um, another really neat point here is God reveals to us in Genesis, God speaks in order to create. How did he create the world? Somebody? How did he come down here and just start rolling up dirt? Did he, spoke. did he say it? He spoke it. Okay. Let there be light. And there was light. So God's so powerful. He does that. All right, part three. I'm going as fast as I can. The incarnation of the Virgin Mary. And so we have the, the line, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. CCC. 484 to 511. All right. Mary made the free choice. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the word of God took flesh. He came into this world. He, by the power of the Spirit, he was born. Thanks to the yes of Mary. And if you've ever heard the beautiful prayer that we deacons get to pray when we were beginning the Eucharist. And we're preparing the cup for the priest. And we pray this prayer. We put a couple of drops of water in the cup. And what does that represent? What have we got? You ever known why we do that? It's humanity. Huh? Our sacrifice. Okay. That's, that's good. It's, and also his sacrifice. Remember when he was on the cross and he yep. was pierced? What flowed from his side? Water. Blood, blood, blood and, water. and water. Yes. So that's what that's about. But we do that and then we pray this beautiful prayer. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Okay? So... That's in a very beautiful and powerful way, the way uh, the in in incarnation. Uh, in the Latin rite, there's a tradition of bowing during the paragraph in honor of the incarnation. Okay, it's really, it's the enfleshment of Jesus. It's what we celebrate at Christmas. It makes one of the most important moments, marks one of the most important moments in human history, doesn't it? And Jesus became man became one of us, fully human, born as a baby. Then there's the part four, the Paschal mystery, the life, death, resurrection, and ascension. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. He rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Okay, this is directly connected to the previous one. This paragraph is directly connected to, to Mary's and become, him becoming human. He became man in order to accomplish the work of what? Of salvation. He came to introduce to us, to show us who the Father really was. He came to bring us salvation. And the Council Fathers even included under Pontius Pilate to show that this was really a historical reality. In other words, he didn't just, they didn't just say in some period in time, he said under Pontius Pilate. Um, so it really happened. 40 days after rising from the dead, he lifted himself up into heaven. What do we call that? Class? Ascension. The ascension. The ascension. Can you imagine being those disciples and standing there and going, whoa, where did he go? <laughs> Look, there he is up in the sky. Okay, now let me just give you a little, little note here. Um, just FYI. Jesus ascended into heaven. Mary was what into heaven? Yeah. You, you said, it, Rebecca, assumed. Assume. Was assume. assumed into heaven. What's the difference in ascension and assumption? You ever thought about that? Maybe Jesus, by his own power, uh, ascended into heaven. Not maybe. And, uh, did. <laughs> Definitely. That's exactly right. Definitely ascended into heaven, and Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit, was assumed into heaven. That's exactly right. That's exactly Thank right. You. Yep. It's beautiful. Jesus did it on his own, basically. <laughs> he went, whoop, he went up. All right. So, all right. Then uh, the second coming, and the passing away of the old heaven and the old earth, and the establishing of the new kingdom. All right. Part five the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. In 687 to 688 is a discussion of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, God's Spirit, who reveals God, makes known to us in Christ his word, his living um, utterance. But the Spirit does not speak of himself. The Spirit, who has spoken through the prophets, makes us hear the Father's word. But we do not hear the Spirit himself. We know him only in the movements by which he reveals the word to us and disposes us to welcome him in faith. The Spirit of, the tru of truth, who unveils Christ to us, will not speak on his own. Such properly divine self-effacement um, explains why the world cannot receive him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. While those who believe in Christ know the Spirit, because they do, he dwells with him. All right, so that's the, the Holy Spirit comes. We believe in God in three persons. One God in three persons. Third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit, who we also rightly call Lord and the giver of life. Um, holy breath of God the Spirit gives life and sustains life. So the Trinity is the mystery of God as he is. It's difficult to wrap, or to wrap our finite brains around this mystery in any meaningful way. Our metaphors are usually, ma usually material, okay? We try to explain it. And how do we explain the mystery of the Trinity? To the best of our ability, we use stuff that we know and recognize, right? You've heard the three-leaf clover. Have you heard that? Yes. Right? You've got one clover with three leaves. Well, it's one clover, but it's three separate leaves. That's one explanation. Another one is on talking about different states of water. You've got different. You got ice. You got liquid. You got vapor, right? They're all water, but they're three different things here. Those are all fall short. God is three persons. One God, three persons. I'm getting close. Am I okay? Time? Yep. <laughs> all right. I'm wrapping up. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I can 
I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. CCC number 748, if you want to read that. Okay. The church of Jesus Christ is his mystical body. Therefore, the church is holy. Even if sometimes the human beings who compro compromise uh, or comprise it are not holy. The church is one because Christ is one. The church is Catholic because the church is universal. So Catholic, when it's used as a small c, means universal. I believe in one holy Catholic, little small c, and universal. That's why some people of other denominations, even not Catholic, no Roman Catholic, can say this creed because they're saying we're one church. All right, Catholic means universal. The church is apostolic because Christ founded upon the apostles. They went out and took the belief to the world. We enter into the church through one baptism of Christ. We believe in one baptism. <clears throat> you know, in many churches, if you come and join their church and you are baptized in one some other church, they want you to be baptized again in their church. Well, we don't believe that. We believe that if you were baptized in a legitimate baptism, which anybody know what the two primary essential things are for a legitimate baptism? Water. And the Trinity. Water and the Trinity. Exactly right. You can't baptize with a Coca-Cola. And um, there's only one one or just a couple of churches that a, Pentecost, a couple of Pentecostal churches that baptize only in the name of Jesus. You see that in scripture one time, but uh, they baptize only in the name of Jesus. And we don't consider that a valid baptism. So all the rest, Methodist, Baptist, all the rest, we consider to be legitimate baptism and we accept them. So once they come into our CIA or something, but they've been baptized in another faith, we accept that. All right, so um, we look forward to the life of the world to come with the Lord through our faith. And then we conclude this creed with the word, what? Amen. 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 And that means, yes, so be it. I believe. The only, it is the only ending of the creed that we can offer as human beings. All right. God's revealed it to us, and the best we can do is to say, Amen. Okay. Um, I haven't thought about this in a long time, but I'm going to share this with you in closing. <clears throat> and I share it with you to give you encouragement. That's, it's late and I'm tired, so I'm, I may not be able to get through it, but I'm going to try. Um, but I want to give you encouragement in what you're doing. And, you know, Martha, maybe even if you can share this with the parents, I'm not sure. You, you make that a, a discernment. When, in 1977, my wife and I had a profound spiritual conversion. I had become Catholic in 1969, but it was in 1977 that we were both, in my former Protestant word terminology, we were born again. Um, in Catholic terminology, we ex experienced metanoia. Okay, <laughs> um, and, and we everything that I knew from up went from up here to, to, to my heart. And so the first thing we did was. Um, it went and jumped and volunteered to teach at that time called CCD. Okay. That was just the first thing on our hearts was to teach CCD. And of course, um, you, you guys will appreciate this. They gave me, they gave us the, uh, the, the most difficult group that they had where they needed some teachers because they didn't have any. They gave us the seventh and eighth graders. <laughs> so, so well, here we go. First, our first experience of teaching uh, CCD and it was with seventh and eighth or eighth graders, whichever. And so one year at the end of the year, my wife and I just at the end of the year just gave them this, each one of them, just this simple little wooden cross. You may have seen it in one of those little hand crosses. 
you know, that you can just hold in your hand. We gave each as a gift at the end of the year. So many years went by and been in that class. And he told me he wanted to get together with me to share something with me. I said, okay. So I met him for lunch. And this is all to the point of you never know what it is that you're doing that's going to touch these kids by sharing your faith. And so he told me that he, after that, he was so touched by our obvious faith that we had that he kept that cross in his pocket forever and because it meant so much to him it represented what he knew was faith that he wanted but he just didn't quite have it well time went on and he got into college and he became very very depressed but he continued to have that cross in his pocket. Well, then one day he lost the cross. He was staying at home at that time. He was visiting or something with his mom and he lost the cross and he got even more depressed. And so he went to bed that night and he through the night had planned to get up the next morning and to take his life. So what happened? The next morning, his mom knocked on the door. She said, son, son, look what I found. I found this cross. I found your cross. It was in the washing machine. And he wanted to share with me that at that moment, that saved his life. He changed his mind. And it was because of the representation of the faith that he wanted so badly and that it just, he knew God was speaking to him. So my point is, guys, you never, ever know what way you're touching some of these kids, okay? So I appreciate what you're doing. I you know, admire you for what you're doing and your your willingness to teach and to serve and to be volunteers. So thanks a ton.